Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. This addition to Insider's Guide to Energy is brought to you by Fidectus. Go to www.fidectus.com for more information. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and with me is co-host Johan Oberg. Johan, what's happening? Hey, Chris. Great to be on again. Um, enjoying another sunny day in Switzerland uh, and uh, looking forward to a show that I was a little bit anxious about, actually, because we're now digging into topics that I am in deep water on, but extremely interesting to learn more about this. I, I assume you have a grill on your deck? <laughs> Probably do. And everything will be clear. But right now, I'm a little bit... Uh, we'll see. But this is why, why we have the show. You know? This well, is why we do it. I, I was a little bit skeptical, but I, I do know that I spent some time living in New Hampshire and that I heated my house with propane. I used propane for my house because I didn't have uh, a natural gas choice at the time. Hmm. And I also look at things as living in Europe right now and look at this coming winter and kind of wonder what's going to happen because we really don't have pipelines that are going to provide reliable uh, gas to much of Europe. So it should be interesting to see what the North American perspective is and to go there. And then what's really interesting to me is when I think renewables and sustainability, propane never crosses my mind to be totally candid. And, and I think our guest today may help me see a different picture. Maybe not, but that's that's what I suspect will happen. So that's what I'm hoping will happen today. No, and I agree. I, I think for me personally, I, I think I just want to learn the basics. You know, what is it? How does it work? Obviously, a little bit more deep dive than the basic, but you, you get my drift. But also understanding what role would it play? You know, we talk a lot about the decarbonization. We talk about sustainable energy and the future of microgrids. We're talking about the new energy ecosystems. Really curious to see where propane sits in this one. Yeah, uh, I think that's important because I, I know that many of my friends' generators for their house when the power goes out yeah. happen to be propane today. That that yeah. happens to be where they're, they're generated. When, yeah. the, when the grid goes out, propane seems to light up their house again. So it'll be interesting to see how this play, but I'll turn it back to you. And I think what we always say, why why speculate anymore? Why don't bring on the experts? That's why we have them on the show. So what I would like to do then is welcome uh, Tucker Perkins, President and CEO of the Propane Education and Research Council. I hope I got that right, but welcome to the show, Tucker. Johan, Chris, love to be with you. And I was biting my tongue through that whole opening, just <laughs> wanting to jump right in, but I'll wait. I'll wait just a moment. So let's kick it off. I'll start with a blank canvas. Uh, give me the, heart, the, the drill down, propane, value of it. Where do we well, start? I think it's funny. Everything Chris was saying, I think, is right. Most people don't really think of us as beyond the fuel that powers their grill. And in, and in America or in North America, we tend to call it propane. The rest of the world calls it LPG. Um, and we often aren't really thought of being a big solution in this environmental and energy conundrum we find ourselves in, right? We, we have been about two and a half to 3% of the energy mix. That seems to be about the same number, whether we're talking about the U.S. or the world. Yet the statistic I always find interesting when I do the numbers, we touch somewhere between 50 and 60% of the world's population, always beyond the natural gas main. but a long history in engines. Uh, propane or LPG has been really the most widely used alternative fuel and a strong number three behind gasoline and diesel on worldwide. And Europe certainly knows it as a vehicle fuel. You might know it as a fuel in supply chain, forklifts, material handling in general. And then as Chris said, backup power generation. Uh, but we really have been ready to move beyond that. As, as we're looking for the perfect fuel, we think about the climate, think about greenhouse gases, 
Low carbon fuels like propane offer a tremendous solution, again, beyond the natural gas main, to actually not only reducing greenhouse gases, but when compared to diesel or gasoline, massive reductions in pollutants that harm our health, and then generally solutions that we can afford. So it's it's re been really the right time to talk about how propane fits into this new conversation we have. So that leads me then to the question, why don't we hear more of it? You know, even if it's two, three percent, as you mentioned, uh, but you touch such a big part of it, uh, the way you see it, it is will be a, a big part or at least a part of the the carbon free or the carbon neutral energy world. So wh why don't we hear more of it? I really think it comes back to the way we distribute it. And you don't, you know, certainly electricity is distributed by massive utilities, natural gas is by massive utilities. And propane is generally always a byproduct of natural gas. So generally the people who find, produce, distribute natural gas will also have propane divisions. But it's just always been kind of a secondary backup fuel. And frankly, I think today that plays to our advantage as we think about systems of the future that are likely not to be a monofuel system. They're likely to be solar, wind in partnership with something else. You know, we've never been electricity or natural gas. We've never been the dominant player. And now as we think about these modern systems, particularly in residential, commercial, power generation particularly, we're, we come to the table ready to work with solar and wind and be one of a number of fuels in the system. So I think as we even look forward, that previous, if you will, weakness, I don't know if it was a weakness, but it was certainly, we always coexisted with other fuels, now proves to be a real strength. So I guess the question that I have is what I said in the opening is when I think green, so if I think of carbon reduction or you, you talked about wind and solar, um, you know, I don't think propane. So help me understand how it's a greener or less of less of an impact on the environment than other gases or other fuels. Well, one propane has no methane. So, uh, really a, in fact, a big article circling the globe right now about how propane is perhaps the perfect refrigerant because of its low global warming potential. But, you know, I think that's that's where the narrative to me has been so wrong is that in order to achieve a clean climate, we must eliminate fossil fuels and we must go to electrification. Well, that's wonderful when the form of electrification might be nuclear or hydro or solar wind, but that's not really how we do it today, right? A lot of it is coal and oil and wood. And so I'll use numbers because we study the U.S. grid extensively. If you take all of the fuels that go into producing electricity in the U.S. grid today, the carbon intensity eventually computes to about 154. The carbon intensity of conventional propane is 80. So on a grid basis, propane is almost twice as clean in carbon intensity as the current grid. Now, it kind of ranges from Vermont, which is almost exclusively hydroelectric and wonderful, a lot of states have a higher than you would expect proportion of nuclear. Um, but still, I'm shocked how much electricity is generated in the U.S. from coal and oil. And so I'm always struck the narrative today is in order to get to a clean climate, we need to replace fuels with modern electricity. I'm quick to say coal, oil, and wood are pretty dirty. Electricity made from coal, oil, and wood, it's equally dirty, if not worse, because of the inefficiencies of the production. So the direct use of low carbon fuels, and as far as I really want to talk about, there are only two, propane and natural gas, have the ability to decarbonize today. And again, I'm pretty happy talking into 2040, maybe 2050. And I'm quick to say, you know, beyond 2050, we don't really understand, I think, where hydrogen might be, where batteries will be, uh, where some new efficiency tricks. And that's been our game all along is working on the efficiency of our technology, which is the final piece of that puzzle, is we, we are actually able easily to replace diesel fuel in so many environmentally sensitive applications that that's where we re really need to be talking today. It would improve 
it would improve the climate, it would quickly improve health, and I think it would actually speak very much to justice as we think about redeploying investment. So, but really almost that's not new, investment. right? I mean, if, if you think about it, I, I, I'm not particularly old, but I'm not particularly young, but propane buses have been kind of, you know, they write clean on them. They've been around for a long time for cities. Um, just last year, I had an Italian intern that worked for me and he would drive over from Milano to my office in his propane powered uh, Italian sports car. Um, so I, I don't think that's a new use or an uncovering it. No. I mean, I, I, I've seen propane buses for a long time, right? No, you're right. But what I think what is new is, and, and as we think about, and again, the European condition was always so diesel centric, where in at least North America, we tend to be much more focused on gasoline. But for years, a diesel fuel was, was efficient and a diesel engine was quite durable. So for a decade, really, we've been working on thermal efficiency and durability. And what you're referring to, everyone was driving gasoline equipment that was modified to operate on propane. Today, we begin to talk about purpose-built purpose -built engines that for the first time ever, and we're in a partnership with Cummins where we demonstrate it now, uh, we're going to production in 2024 is our uh, current estimate but we have beaten the thermal efficiency of diesel, matched the durability of diesel, yet 25% cleaner in greenhouse gases, virtually zero in particulate matter, and frankly at a cost that everyone can afford. And with such a simple emission system, it's the simplest of three-way catalysts. So what you are correct, propane as a vehicle fuel has been around for, I don't know, probably 70 years, if we're really honest. But this latest generation is more thermally efficient, more powerful, and frankly, more clean than anything we've seen. So when we look at this, we, we, we have done a quite a extensive on electric cars and electric vehicles, and we're talking about this change in mobility. And just for, for, for my information, when we look at uh, the vehicles or, or the, the areas that you're talking about now, where do you see that applies? Is it, is it in, in your... your normal cars is it in cargo is wh wh where do you see the propane yeah no it's it's clearly mobility. where we can feature that energy dense uh need so not passenger vehicles mm -hmm. and i would i would often say not passenger vehicles at all but i'm quick to say there's still a movement around high idle high mileage things like limos taxis police fleets but our our very core of our emphasis is on vehicles where payload and range matter. Vehicles that are generally in the US, we'd call them class four to seven, but anything that's delivering goods, freight, you know, running long distances, irregular routes, where batteries just really aren't feasible today. Maybe they're not feasible because the range is too much or the temperature is too cold or too hot. Maybe the payload is too great. And almost in all of those cases, the economics. I mean, we school buses are a big deal for us, and I kind of have those numbers on the top of my head. An electric school bus cost four times the price of a propane school bus. I would argue at the end of the day, and the grid mix is about, it can be a wash, the emissions profile is almost similar for a, on a full economic cycle. So there, there the answer is for the same uh, benefit one product is four times more than the other. And I'm quick to say, I don't really care whether you take a propane school bus or a diesel school, excuse me, or an electric school bus. What matters is that we get rid of the older diesel engines at four times the rate. That's the benefit to the economy and to the climate as well. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, we don't in transportation, we're certainly not thinking about consumer cars. I know in the U S we've kind of crossed that 5% sales threshold, which would imply you're moving, you know, you've hit that first breakthrough in the in the chasm of innovation. Uh, but we, we certainly and work with lots of clients who have to deliver goods every day, care about the cost, care about the reliability of going 400 miles today and 200 miles tomorrow. That's our that's our market. I would I would say if you give me an opening, you know, we're on a worldwide basis. We're talking about shipping more than ever. Um, ships needed to move away from bunker fuel. I thought myself it would be LNG. 
Okay. But we're seeing a fairly strong migration to propane fuel ships. And then lastly, massive movement around the ports and material handling and a massive migration in power generation. But so far what you've said from my, like bunker fuel is pretty easy to beat. It's pretty dirty, nasty stuff. And, and everybody knew it needed to go away at some point, right? So whether it's hydrogen, whether it's LPG, whether it's propane, the, the bar is pretty, pretty easy to get under there to, to, to improve at least. Um, I guess I, I wonder in you just, the last thing you said, energy production. So, so I did heat a house with propane, right? I, I, I had two, I think 500 pound tanks or gallon tanks or whatever they are buried in my yard. And I, I heated my house up in, in the Northeast with it. Cause that was like no gas and electric would have been too cost prohibitive at the time of where I live. What innovation is taking place for that kind of a situation for heating or powering someone like me, who was kind of in a rural state that, that didn't have all the infrastructure where I lived. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you let me step back just a couple of years, the first innovation was uh, appliances, whether it's to heat your water or to heat the air that are 95% or more efficient. And that's, that's been a relatively new thing. But if I kind of step right into to today, it's around, particularly in the Northeast, it's either really uh, combined heat and power systems. And the latest would be, and again, not a big thing in the Northeast, but micro cooling and combined heating power systems. So units that residentially or commercially produce about as much power as you need, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, highly efficient, allow you to live kind of off the grid, if you will. So that that's kind of our latest innovation. But in the residential or commercial, as we talk about building net zero homes, again, as I said, we love to partner with solar, particularly there. So using propane with efficient generators, uh, if hot water heating, probably cooking, and then whatever backup would be to your primary heating system, that's probably the, the systems we see today. More sophisticated people, bigger homes, maybe they have a swimming pool they want to heat, then they're automatically thinking about combined heating and power units. And not only are they very efficient devices and cost effective, they're really good for the environment, again, compared to electricity. We, everything I talk about really is compared to electricity and not just how electricity is made today. But we even begin to think about how electricity will look. And we've modeled what most of the utilities say would be their optimum mix for a renewable energy for their grid. And we'll talk about it in a bit. That's why we finally start looking to our own versions of renewable fuels, because whether whether we're getting there with Vermont today or Kentucky 40 years from today, you know, we, if we're going to be a, a fuel that's good for the climate, you have to reduce your carbon. Got it. And that's how we, that's how we eventually walk into renewable propane. You keep giving the example of we do this and we do that. Help me understand who we is. I understand you're an association, but help me understand the we who, who's driving this, this initiative. Well, so I work for a company called the Propane Education and Research Council. We'll never sell a gallon of propane. We'll never buy a gallon of propane. We don't sell appliances. But we're working not only nationally, but worldwide with a consortium of interested people. So it could be Ford Motor Company. It could be General Motors. It could be Deutz. It could be Cummins. It could be uh, Wartzilla uh, and, and all, you know, a bunch of household names like... Uh, those people that make furnaces and water heaters. So in the we there, the we is always people who are interested in making their appliances better. Uh, it could be builders and, and contractors and uh, plumbers and electricians that are installing this stuff. So that we is a large we, and the we could also be the, the propane industry on a worldwide basis, as, particularly as we talk about renewable fuels. Renewable fuels wouldn't be unique to the U.S. or unique to Canada. It's a worldwide thing. And there we work closely with uh, every continent, propane providers on every continent, and actually alternative fuel and renewable fuel producers on every continent as we think about what does renewable propane need to look like uh, 
What are the feedstocks? What are the processes? How do we get it to the market at scale and at a price people are willing to pay? So that's an interesting part. So obviously we're seeing this transformation, not only in Europe where we sit now, but especially in the US, there's there's a lot of incentives coming out uh, from, from the government as well, where which is probably going to change uh, the landscape that we never seen before, <laughs> because it's it's a massive investment in 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 terms of the the climax bill, but it's not whatever it's called. How how do you work with this? How do you ensure that because if if it's it's one part of this new ecosystem, propane fills a specific area. It has a value moving forward. So how do you ensure that this is also then part of where the investments are going moving forward? Because we we talk a lot about two things. Well, three things. It's solar. It's wind and it's batteries, and it feels some t- and and obviously you throw EVs on the side of it because it's kind of a solution to it. But how do you how do you make sure then that propane sits within this and and you get your share of voice? So well, we are always working to that share of voice for sure. And I think I would say for years we haven't had share of voice, and and we may be just in the babyest steps of share of voice today. But one of the ways we do it, I mean, to your point, is we closely work with Department of Energy. We closely work with the national labs. We just uh, jointly did a report where one of the national labs came out, and it just came out last week, that talked about how to make renewable propane and is making renewable propane economically viable for the producer of renewable diesel or sustainable aviation fuel. But We don't talk about it much and you don't read a lot about it coming out of Department of Energy or you don't, for that matter, even Cummins, you know, engine company. But I can tell you, you know, inside both, we have a lot of alliances and a lot of projects where we are working together. Department of Energy did just happen to underwrite several of our projects. Um, One, which is exactly what we've been talking about, where they will use renewable propane in a university setting to power the university's chillers and that and to really gain good experience showing not only the emissions but the cost benefit for a renewable propane in you know really a almost an industrial setting to to power the university's grid you mentioned that the agencies right at least from from an american perspective that we have um, and in the pre-call we talked a little bit about policy going on so how, how does propane fall into the latest policy that is just going through the U.S. government right now? Well, I mean, the numbers that are on top of my head, uh, and we're still trying to dissect exactly the Inflation Reduction Act, which about $370 billion of that really is intended to climate. Uh, the rest of it is really health care and a few other things. But if I go back and look to the previous bill where we really kind of have clarity on the numbers, about $9 billion of that was directly applicable to propane projects, whether it's school transportation or transportation uses, port uses, or even developing a more robust infrastructure to use propane vehicles across the country. And, you know, I think we would always wish this administration was a little bit more proactive in thinking about decarbonizing today. And I do think, by the way, this last round is a little bit more, uh, realistic about decarbonizing today, but it doesn't make the headlines, but we see this Department of Energy, uh, this administration, really thinking about how propane and natural gas have solutions to decarbonize today. And we're getting our share. I mean, the good news is we don't ask for much, right? Most of our solutions we are able to fund, and most of the solutions we're talking about today are fairly shovel ready. Now, you know, lots of innovation going on. And I could talk about, let's let's do talk about renewable propane eventually. But even as we think about, you know, maybe everybody's, well, beyond hydrogen uh, uh, and and nuclear, we're even trying to understand how propane fits in the hydrogen economy. And it's quite likely, I mean, the, the conventional wisdom is we'll produce hydrogen where people may not be and we'll convert it to ammonia that's easily to transport. The similarities between propane and ammonia are striking, right? And we're we're in a few worldwide test pilots right now where we do produce uh, hydrogen, tra- convert it to propane, 
and then use the you know transport the propane easily. So so much innovation at the forefront, but right now we are straightforward thinking about it in three uses. So um, is it transportation though, truck basically or ship? Is it is it big containers like like how it used to get it to my house where a big truck comes? Or how do you normally transport the propane? You liquefy it. Can it, be, it can be, an, it, that has been the beauty of propane, right? So easy to transport, low pressure, not really special steel, transports as a liquid. So whether it's in a small truck, a transport truck, uh, a train car, or a ship, I mean, that is the beauty. It, it, it's so easy to transport, which is why we've always existed beyond the natural gas mains. And excuse my ignorance, but the energy density of propane compared to the other fuels you mentioned, how does it stack up on that? Uh, twice as dense as natural gas, half as dense, if you will, as diesel fuel. So it kind of kind of matches you know, gasoline somewhere is about the same. So, but I mean, there's a good example. For years, as we thought about positioning propane against diesel fuel, you know, we were trying to achieve diesel-like mileage. And now for the first time, we're getting the thermal, we're matching thermal efficiency. That has two, two great impacts. One, we pick up our miles per gallon significantly compared to diesel. And secondly, we cut our cost. And third, we, uh, on a cost per mile, most fleets that move from diesel to propane, uh, historically, they, they cut their cost in half. Today, they're cutting their cost by 75% just because propane hasn't seen that run up in price like diesel or natural gas has for that matter. We're, we're at a really wonderful sweet spot in our pricing spectrum today. So is this something that also relates then to the OEMs? Because one, one of the, the discussions we've had and one of the thoughts is, is obviously we, we come from one side, which is the energy industry. Okay. We, we know how to produce the energy. We know how to transport it. We know the density, we know the value of it. And then you have the other side, which is actually application, which is the OEMs. Uh, and they might not think in the same kind of lines that we do or the energy industry do. So they say, okay, I want this kind of, I want diesel or I want a battery driven car or something else. So how, how does this relationship work? Because the OEMs, are they leading this one? They decide where they want to go or, or is it, is it, is it enough of, of an economic from, from, from the propane or from the batteries or from the diesel to actually check to, to affect the OEMs who kind of, who kind of has the leading ball here? <laughs> it kind of goes back to Chris's earlier question, all, which is who is the we you keep referring to? Because <laughs> it generally is done in a partnership. And I love to talk about Cummins as, as someone, because I'm so familiar with that. You know, clearly they see long-term a view where hydrogen might rain, where battery electric will need to rain, but they know it's not ready yet. And so we've been working with them for almost eight years because they could see that diesel emissions were eventually going to become so complex that diesel fuel might not be a relevant fuel. And so they, they saw propane as an intermediate step. The issue for them and rightfully so was they didn't want this rehashed gasoline vehicle that was just modified. They wanted that same Cummins quality engine with that same power and reliability and warranty. And and so it's been a painstaking effort, but now we're at the final end of that where they can produce this purpose-built propane engine that exhibits many of the features and benefits of their diesel technology using another fuel. That would be the same conversation on a worldwide basis with someone like Orsilla, who has really seen how their engines can handle multiple fuels, making sure propane is one of them. And by the way, we're all kind of scrambling now as we think about how does renewable propane fit into this? How do renewable propane blends where we match with renewable DME? Um, and so we're in those kinds of conversations with, you know, household names in this space, at least like Orsilla and Siemens and, you know, packaging manufacturers that manufacture uh, off-grid, microgrid packages and that kind of thing. So uh, a lot of work all the way down to household generator names, like Chris mentioned earlier, like Generac. Briggs and Kohler. Hmm. I, I kind of wonder, so we're talking transportation and, and I see the use there. Also in the pre-call, um, we had talked a little bit about the situation in Ukraine and maybe opportunistically, if I look what's happening in Europe or what I expect to happen in Europe um, this winter, how are you responding? I mean, 
LNG is certainly responding. That that's certainly a strategy. I think terminals have gotten completed even since the the war started. I think the timing is good in some LNG. You certainly see the trading of that and and Europe's maybe need for that. How is propane going to play in? And do you see with the cost of energy an opportunity in countries like Germany that burn a lot of coal, that get oil from you know, Russia and other uh, countries in Europe? What's What's the propane association doing there? And, and is it going to be part of the solution? Am I going to start seeing propane solutions this winter to help help with the, the problems here in Europe? Well, I do think, sadly, everything. I mean, we, we need all the solutions available to the people of Germany, France, you know, that that whole, you know, the Great Britain. And so certainly propane is is migrating over there. You read about the LNG trade moving from predominantly the East Coast to Europe. But propane is following and propane will be used in multiple ways there. One, and I think people realize that we often take propane, mix it with air to make the equivalency of natural gas in a blended system. That's going on. And I think propane will also begin to replace some of those uses for diesel fuel and natural gas beyond those mains. So, yeah, and we're we're seeing the migration of propane over into Europe, just like we've been seeing the migration of LNG. But are you seeing um, a, a dramatic uptick in the last few months preparing for this winter or is there yes, demand not, not, ships? Really not just in the last few months for a bit longer than that. But you you see a pretty strong export and propane has always been, you know, exported. We're, we're The U.S. propane industry is the predominant supplier to almost all of Central America, most of South America, most of Asia now. Um, and now we're supplying as much as we can into Europe. Is it less expensive? Because I know just filling my grill up here is multiples more expensive than getting a propane refill in the US um, just to get a tank to, to run a grill. So is it gonna be cost competitive or is it gonna be part of these you know ridiculous fuel prices that people, if they can get power, are gonna pay this winter? Well, I think sadly it's gonna, you know, all things are kind of benchmarked off natural gas to a degree. Um, which is why you see fuels beginning to be exported over there. So I can only talk, I really don't follow the international market that well in terms of pricing. I mean, you, you see our natural gas U S pricing is significantly less than European natural gas pricing right now. Um, and propane oddly enough has not had that big run up in price relative to diesel or natural gas. And so, uh, I think as we get closer to winter, the general expectation is you'll see these prices continue to rise. But I do expect propane or LPG, as it's certainly known in Europe, you know, will continue to be exported into Europe and be a part of the solution. I think sadly, sadly for Europe right now, it's it's really three components, right? It's first having supply uh, in order to get through the winter. The second is trying to control the cost. And then the third feature is can we, can we protect the environment while we're doing it. And I think most people right now are thinking about security of supply before they think about the other two. I think that's, I, I think you're totally right on that one. It's, it's a question we've had on, on, on multiple discussions in terms of what's going to give in. So we talked about sustainable, we talked about the transformation to renewable energy and, and, and the carbon neutral neutrality, but then we had, came into a situation in the last couple of months, and suddenly what's going to give in and and the question we see that we're firing up more and more coal in germany for example now when there's no nuclear as well so i think there is a little bit of a challenge here but with your experience you, you've been in in the the industry for a long time you you obviously is an expert in propane but you know the rest as well H how do you see this coming along uh, maybe from a european perspective but also from a u.s perspective do you see that we're we're starting to, to look into more, I, I, literally what I'm trying to say, are we slowing down the shift to carbon neutral or to sustainable energy right now? Or is it just a glitch? Well, I, I'm always quick to say, I don't think using propane, in fact, using conventional propane today, using renewable propane tomorrow, I don't think that's slowing down the shift to reducing carbon in the atmosphere. I actually think that tends to be accelerating the shift because what we can do is quickly displace those fuels that we're using today. And, you know, I look at the, the EIA data that comes out of the U.S. or I look at the IEA data that comes worldwide. You don't see a big fall off 
in oils and coals, right? Even if you look out into 2030, you see those projections are relatively flat. Mm -hmm. And I think what I keep saying and have been saying now for a couple of years, and the more I study the data, the more I want to say it is using low carbon fuels like propane and natural gas in place of higher carbon fuels like coal and oil or dirty fuels like wood. And certainly we're going to talk as much about climate as we are about health with particulate matter. There's a great opportunity to get to a lower carbon future faster using propane. And again, I don't expect propane to replace the local natural gas utility or the local electric utility you know, where I see tremendous improvements, and now I'm beginning to see the implementation, we already produce most of the power through the Caribbean. We're, in fact, I was just back from Puerto Rico, where there we are producing power for some large industrial facilities manufacturing because they wanted to control their power generation. They wanted to control their price. And by the way, they're doing it in a cleaner method than they were doing it before. So how, how did you do that though, right? So a lot of island nations use diesel typically, which is dirty and expensive, Right. but the governments tend to tax that very heavily. And so part of the reason for the transition we've done shows on that is being slow there is not that the people don't want to have cleaner energy, but, but it funds a lot, right? There's high tax on that diesel coming in. So how do you get around that and change an island nation to move to propane from the, the diesel coming in? Um, I guess, I, and it's funny, I don't know the answer to that as well as I should, but we have not had any economic barrier to bringing in propane. So tremendous environmental benefit. And, you know, the Virgin Islands kind of started that. Roatan Bay, Honduras kind of picked it up from there. And we see the laid in cost of propane into those island nations significantly lower than that of diesel fuel. You know, so uh, um did they buy all new infrastructure? Is the, the generators completely from the ground up for propane? Or are they able to use the diesel infrastructure they had? Uh, it can. De it just depends. Wartzilla could kind of runs on a variety of things. Siemens can run on a variety of fuels. Um, and so it just kind of depends on what that base technology was. But most of these plants, they are putting in new infrastructure and new equipment because they're really looking for this efficient. You you know, y'all talk about, I seem to say the same things, but you'll always hear me talk about looking for these efficient solutions as well, because those are the ones that are going to be able to run for decades. Um, but yeah, we and again, I see this migration towards not, not massive power generation, not gigawatt scale power generation, but, you know, microgrids and, you know, our typical systems might be 100 kW, but as we move into industrial situations, we put in a bunch of half gig systems that seem to provide not only economically beneficial power, reliable power, but uh, environmentally favorable power. So if we set aside the discussion we had before, David, we jump forward a little bit uh, around um the Ukraine and the situation in Europe for the moment. But do you see any regional differences in, in, in the adoption of propane moving forward? Is there any, we mentioned the islands now, which is quite interesting. Oh, yes. I see, see a massive, massive regional. I mean, yeah. and, and so I see a massive regional difference. I mean, first off, let's go to, let's go to Africa just for a moment to the developing nations that are coming off oil, um, excuse me, wood or dung. There, you know, we're in the simplest forms of just home cooking using clean propane or even some small versions of power gen, massive improvements to the economy, to the environment, to the health and being of the family as we clean up the air and save, you know, what we think to be two to three million lives a year from indoor air quality. So that's one end of the spectrum and it's happening in front of your eyes right now with massive support from the United Nations. You know, we kind of look to Europe, maybe, or Asia on the other end, very sophisticated CHP systems, uh, very sophisticated power generation that, again, propane has a strong role beyond the natural gas main. In America, exact same. We're, we're in the, to use a baseball analogy, not great for all of your Europeans, I know, but, you know, we're really in the first inning of a, of a nine inning game as we think about power generation, transportation, and the next way we use propane. Because now we used to only talk about portability, versatility, 
and perhaps economy. Now, we probably lead with, is this good for the environment? If they can say yes, then we say, can we afford that solution? Is that solution wise? And how do we do it? And that's where we are today. But clearly, we keep coming back. Power generation, transportation, and material handling in and around the ports. Those are the three markets without without even stepping back from our core traditional markets of residential, commercial, and agricultural. I think you did a really good job in that last sum up because I was, I was texting Johan on the side saying we're running out of time on the episode, but I think you brought it nicely together for us to take us through, through the journey. Um, for me, it's been eye opening because as I said, when we first talked about being a guest on the show, I really didn't know what to expect of propane. Um, I think I have a little bit better understanding. Johan, I, I leave it to you to bring a closure to the show and then I'll sign us off at the end. Yeah, but I, I agree with you, Chris, and I'll, I'll wrap it up fairly quickly. I, I think as I started out in the beginning, I was very novice around what propane, the areas of it, where does it sit for the future? It gave me a very, very good overview of this one and and seeing that this fits into it. And I'm also quite interesting to hear that it, it's actually ready into the infrastructure there is. That was one of my questions as well, which always alluded a little bit in the back end. But I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was a great input. Uh, I also like, as we always say, we like people that are passionate about their thing. And, and there was no doubt about passion in this one. So really, thanks Tucker for joining. Uh, Tucker. Pleasure to have you on Insider's Guide to Energy. I've really enjoyed the time with both of you and I look forward to kind of staying connected over the years. A lot, a lot of innovation and a lot of new things, both for propane and really for competing fuels. Well, Tucker, thank you so much to our audience. We hope you've enjoyed this show as much as we have. If you have, please share it with your friends, subscribe, like it, add comments. And for the audience, once again, you've enjoyed another episode of Insider's Guide to Energy. We look forward to speaking to you again next week and we'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.